Hey everyone, thank you so much for spending your time here listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. And today I'm taking a a bit of a deviation from the usual kind of stoic themes of the podcast. I know we've done that a lot this year, uh, but this episode might actually uh, shed some light on the reasons why I'm uh, kind of diversifying the topics that I'm going to be using uh, on this podcast, but still tying it back into philosophy and, and wisdom. Because today I wanted to start what will be uh, two or three episodes based around the wisdom of Miles Davis. Now, if, if you don't know who Miles Davis is, then jump on Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube. Uh, actually, YouTube would be great because then you can get some visuals as well. But, uh, and, and just search Miles Davis. Miles Davis was one of the most influential uh, musicians slash artists of all of history. Uh, and And one of the most prolific creators as well. Uh, very few people have been as as uh, intensely creative as Miles Davis was. Uh, and uh, he was part of the movement that we all now know as jazz, you know, coming up through the, uh, the late 30s, early 40s, and uh, I believe his career lasted all the way until uh, the early 90s. Uh, when he died, but uh, but Miles was uh, just such a influential an, an influential figure in the course of music as we know it today, and also in the lives of some of the most brilliant musicians of all time. People like Herbie Hancock, uh, the the legendary pianist, uh, uh, Carlos Santana. Uh, you know, uh, we think of John Coltrane, uh, you know, all these musicians who came through Miles Davis's band. And, uh, and so uh, this year at university, when I've been finishing my degree there, uh, you know, I've done a lot of research on Miles Davis, uh, looking particularly not so much at the music, although I have been listening to a lot of that, uh, but looking at the things that he said, the philosophy of life that he lived uh, the the wisdom in the words that he spoke, because uh, as you may have known from the episode that I did last week, uh, I've actually written uh, an essay as a part of university, but I've put it on my website uh, so you can find it there. It's called uh, The Miles Method, A Theory of Transformative Artistry. So it's 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 mostly for um, artists and people who are interested in, in developing uh, their creativity or their artistic career. Um, to to a high degree, um, but uh, but what I wanted to do in these episodes is really call upon some of the uh, extremely wise uh, notions that that Miles Davis uh, kind of shared in in his philosophy of life, and and so a lot of this is interpretation, and I'm drawing connections between a lot of ideas, um, and uh, and and you know that there's obviously a danger of of misconstruing his words or the way he actually felt but i think that uh if if we can interpret uh some of his you know his his best lines from interviews or his best quotes from his book uh, for example um you know you can you can really get some important lessons for life important lessons for how to live uh, a good interesting and uh and and profound uh, profoundly insightful life, uh, because Miles Davis was quite different to most musicians, as ma- as many of you who have listened to uh, his work will know, and he really did change the course of music uh, many, many times. There's a great story, uh, there's a wonderful story uh, that he tells in his autobiography, uh, where he actually, uh, he was at a, I, I believe it was a gala dinner, um, for uh, for Ray Charles uh, for a Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, the President of the United States was there and all these famous people. And uh, he was sitting next to this woman and he got into somewhat of a, a, a bit of a testy kind of conversation with her. Uh, things weren't going so well between them. And she said something along the lines of, uh, well, you know, what have you done that's so important in your life that you're here tonight? And he turned around to her and he said, well, I've changed music five or six times. 
and then so, said something uh, quite unsavory to her, uh, something like, you know, what, a, what have you done other than being white? Um, and, uh, and, you know, he was actually true to his word in, in, that, uh, in that quote there because uh, he did change music five or six times. Uh, you know, whether it's with his albums like, for example, uh, Kind of Blue, uh, or the birth of the cool sketches of Spain, uh, bitches brew, or or something like Tutu. Uh, you know these were all revolutionary albums that came about that completely changed the sound of music to come, the direction of the music industry, uh, and his career really was a a it was kind of a bulldozer through a forest kind of thing, paving the way. You know, paving the way for new musicians to come and uh, for new sounds to come about. And, uh, and, and that's what I find so interesting about Miles Davis uh, because that's where his biggest difference was between a lot of musicians. Uh, my musical mentor, Paul Cusick, here on the Sunshine Coast, a wonderful pianist, uh, he once said to me, how do you get a musician who starts out his career playing in the swing bands of the 40s and ends his career talking about doing a collaboration with Jimi Hendrix or Prince, you know. How do you get that kind of musician who, who is able to go through so many different genres, so many different styles, so many different sounds, and have such a diverse career? Uh, and that's an interesting question, and that's the, that's the ultimate question around Miles Davis, is how do you get somebody who... Uh, is able to diversify to such a large degree creativity, uh, creatively, uh, and and take a career from from you know the swing bands all the way through to uh, cool jazz, all the way through to fusion and funk, and and then you know to rock and and uh, you know as he called them the social sounds of of the time. And there are profound lessons that we can actually learn for our own lives about this. I've, I've been thinking about this deeply um, ha- as it pertains to, say, ideas of the logos or universal reason, the, the governing principle. Because Miles once said that you can tell the history of jazz in four words, Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker. But if if you take that quote and then you add, well, you can tell the history of jazz in six words: uh, Miles Davis, Louis Arm, sorry, Louis Armstrong, uh, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis. Then you have a really interesting tale to tell, uh, a tale that is very archetypal when it comes to uh, the mythological substructures of a lot of the stories that we tell. Uh, a tale that can teach you a lot about uh, with which part of your life you identify and a tale that can tell you uh, a lot about what we actually are as human beings. So let me tell that story briefly. So you have Louis Armstrong, who, you know, many consider to be one of the fathers of jazz. Uh, You know, he was, he was a very popular uh, singer and trumpeter um, back in the thirties and forties and fifties. Um, and particularly in the style of jazz that we call uh, swing jazz or, uh, you know, the big band sound. Um, and he, he was kind of one of the first really famous solo, uh, solo artists uh, in, in, the, in the jazz scene. And, and his music was, you know, was revolutionary in its own right in that it was highly popular um, and really did change the course of, of music. Uh, but he pretty much stuck with that kind of style throughout his whole career. And, uh, and then you have somebody like Charlie Parker come along. Uh, and Charlie Parker uh, actually grew up and started playing in the swing bands of the 30s and 40s. Uh, but then he kind of left that scene and said, you know, I'm done with this. It's too commercial. It's too, uh, it, it's too popular and it's, it's just becoming, uh, you know, they're, they're basically keeping the style of music back so that they'll make more money, so that we're not progressing, we're not adding anything new, we're not doing anything new. And he came along and he created this style of music that we call bebop. 
And, uh, and that style of music is very different to the commercial big band kind of dance hall music that we, uh, that we saw in the 30s and 40s. In that it is very fast, uh, different ensemble types, very virtuosic, you know, high focus on the speed of, uh, of the musicians uh, soloing. Uh, also very, very um, different in terms of the amount of improvisation that is found within, within bebop. So uh, highly focused on improvisation, uh, highly focused on the individuality of each musician within the, the smaller band. Uh, and and everybody is kind of encouraged to uh, play their part, but uniquely to their own sound, um, and see how that can create new sounds and new styles uh, that flow out of that that one style of bebop. Uh, it's it's a very interesting genre. I have never found it to be um, at one that I particularly love listening to, but uh, but I respect it nonetheless for the art form that it is. Um, and maybe also it's just because I would never be as <laughs> as uh, virtuosic as to to be able to play that kind of uh, that that style. It's it's um it's very hands on, um, but but nonetheless we we find ourselves with these two interesting characters. And there was you know during that time when they were coming out of the swing bands and into the bebop. Uh, you know, there was a kind of turf war in the music scene. Uh, there were those who really wanted to stick with the older styles. People like uh, Louis Armstrong uh, fall, fall into that category. You know, he, he had a quote where he said that, you know, talking about these bebop musicians, all they want to do is show you up and play faster. And as long as, you know, in, as long as that's happening, then they're, they're happy. But, um, you know, he didn't like that it wasn't necessarily dance music. He didn't like that it was... Uh, you know, really pushing a lot of the boundaries that he might have been the one to set, you know. And so uh, you had people like that who really didn't like the newer styles of music. And then you had the people who uh, just wanted to go out there and explore and um, and go into the chaos, you know, go into the unknown and 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 see what was out there in, in, in the sphere of musical creativity. And that was, that was Charlie Parker. But then you have somebody like Miles Davis come along and Miles actually started playing in some of the swing bands and then he went through and actually uh, made his debut into the music scene really um, in, in Charlie Parker's bebop band. So he had that influence there of, of the people in the scene who were really changing things up and moving, uh, progressing the music forward. And... What's really interesting is that you look at the span of their careers and you think, okay, cool. You have Louis Armstrong who who highly identified with that older style of jazz and he wanted to keep that going. That was his safety. Um, then you have somebody like Charlie Parker who went out there and created a revolutionary form of music, but then he really kind of stuck with the bebop for the rest of his life. He, he, he didn't diversify as much as other musicians like Miles Davis. Then you have somebody like, as I said, Miles Davis, who comes along and he is not stuck in the past. He's also not stuck on the new form of uh, creative music that's about bebop. You know, he doesn't get bogged down in, in staying there too long. What he is, is somebody who comes along and says, well, okay, we're not the people who stick with the music of the past. We're not the people who just create something new and then stick with that because then they become the people who stick with the music of the past. Uh, it seems like Miles Davis realized something incredibly uh, um, profound about what a human is, which is that we are the process that transforms what was into what could be. And there are there are signs of this philosophy within his life and his music, uh, not only in the tapes that he recorded, you know, you can see, as I mentioned earlier, you see the recordings of Miles Davis and you can literally, uh, you know, some have said that if you listen to the recordings of Miles Davis, you can get a pretty good idea of the history of, of jazz over that period. You can get a pretty good idea of, of the progression of music over that period. And that's true. Uh, that's that's deadly true. You know, you even look at um, the influence that he had on uh, even the pop music of today. You know, and and in his influence on on creating the music of 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 hip hop and um, and fusion and and funk and and uh, you know all of these popular musics that we that we know and love. And that that was Miles. He was 
you know, the way that I like to describe it, it's like he was the radio and the music that he played was the signal through the radio. And I think that that tells us a really interesting lesson that fits in, as I said, with a lot of the archetypal ideas that we see. For example, uh, you know, you take a look at the mythological structure that we often see, which is kind of, you've got chaos, you've got order, but then you have something in the middle, which is something like the Logos or the governing principle. You know, Heraclitus was the first person to coin uh, the Logos, I, I believe. But uh, throughout history, the Logos has been kind of synonymous with the governing principle, that which transforms what was into what could be. That, what, that which transforms uh, chaos into order. And the tale of jazz, as I just told it, uh, you, you do kind of have that sort of mythological structure there. You have, you know, you have the, the order of uh, somebody like Louis Armstrong who comes along and creates this, this style or gets in on this style and then, um, you know, sticks with that that's order you know that's a safe place for him and then you have the chaos which is kind of uh you know pushing forward into new lanes of creativity like uh like was done with with charlie parker uh but but then you have somebody like miles davis who i really believe in jazz at least represents that governing principle represents the creative and ordering principle of of the universe which which is our ability as human beings to transform what was into what could be. And Miles did that so many times in his career. And I wanted to read a couple of uh, quotes from you here, just so that you know that, uh, uh, you know, he actually did think this sort of stuff. Um, because in his interviews, I love watching his interviews. You, you really have to go online and go on YouTube and search Miles Davis interview because he was such an interesting character in these in these conversations. It surprises me how many interviewers asked similar questions and yet none of them got what he was really trying to say. So many interviewers would call back to the music that he'd recorded previously, um, even sometimes as far back as 17 years and say, you know, hey, is what you're going to be playing tonight, you know, is it, is it going to be similar to what you've done then? Is it going to be similar to what you did then? Uh, is it going to be, you know, are you going to replay your Tutu album or... Um, and he just didn't want to do that. He, he didn't want to look back to the past uh, in terms of what he was playing now. He was constantly trying to push the boundaries and transform what he had played into what uh, was going to be the next social sound, as he called it. Um and, and so there's some great lines in these interviews. You have to check them out. He's got such a raspy voice, such a, a, a an interesting character, often very rude to the interviewers. Uh, but, you know, as as um, Seneca quoted Ar Aristotle, I believe it was, uh, you don't get genius without a touch of madness. Um, and, you know, Miles definitely had the genius and he definitely had the madness. Um but uh, yeah, I want to share with you this uh, a couple of little passages from some interviews so you, you get the kind of attitude that he had around these sorts of things. Um, so he, he was asked in this interview in 1988. Uh, the interviewer asks Davis, uh, what kind of repertoire are you going to be playing tonight? Uh, is it going to be a mixture of the last albums you did in other tours like Decoy, uh, You're Under Arrest, Tutu, or are you going to do something different? So Miles, you can see him... Uh, as he's about to answer this question, he shakes his head throughout the whole question and he's kind of annoyed and he says, no, 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 it's entirely, it's an entirely different thing. Uh, it's gotten a little bit funkier and it goes in another direction. We play Tutu, we play one song that Prince wrote, we play something I wrote, uh, but I reconstructed them and they sound up to date on Prince's side and on James Brown's side uh, and my theory of music. So, here you can see that he's 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 listening to the entire industry for the sounds that are happening at the time and he's trying to you know if he does play something that he once played before it's completely transformed into something new you know and uh, he's he's always looking for how he can push those boundaries into what's what's current and what's going to be next um there's another great moment in that interview where, uh, you know, Miles would often in his interviews, he would 
sit there and listen to the questioner while he was actually uh, uh, drawing um, uh, on 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 a piece of paper, and uh, he'd do these wonderful uh, wonderful creative uh, paintings or you know drawings uh, while he was while he was listening and and uh, you know so he he actually was asked um, by the interviewer who said uh, I have a picture of you right now over here that was done a couple of years ago and the first time I saw it. And then Miles Davis interrupts him there and he places a drawing he has just finished on the lap of the interviewer and he says, here's one that I've done just then, now, you know. He really had this attitude of, uh, listen, stop talking about what I've done, right? Let's talk about what I'm doing. Let's talk about what I have right here now. Uh, let's talk about what's going to be next. Um and that was kind of his his real um, that was his his real uh, struggle as an artist was trying to get people to understand that um, he was going to be pushing forward, paving new directions, paving new sounds, new styles, and people just had to come along with him. And he didn't care if they didn't, but people really did go along with him. And I think that I really do think that there's some really deep reasons why uh why culture fell so much in love with miles davis while why people all around the world all over europe all over america uh there were massive audiences who throughout his whole career wanted to hear what he was doing next i think that that speaks to something about us as human beings which is that we really admire somebody who comes along and doesn't pick a lane, you know, we admire somebody who comes along and says, no, 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 no. What we are is that signal that comes through us, you know, that signal that comes through us uh, from wherever it comes from. And that's what we're supposed to be creating here. Uh, whatever is that, that, that next beautiful thing that we can bring to the world that's what Miles Davis was doing. And he was that that spark of the Logos, you might say. He was listening to that spark of divinity within him, uh, which, which was, uh, you know, the sound of his music. Uh, and I think that there are some really good lessons as well that we can learn uh, for our own lives in this. You know, because in, in, in a time where... Everybody is picking a lane. Everybody's picking a side. Everybody's picking teams. Uh, you know, like it's 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 a strange time in in history. Not necessarily because we've always been picking teams, but you look at the story of Miles Davis and you think this was a man who didn't pick a team. He didn't even like the term jazz. He felt he felt that it really boxed him in far too much. He didn't like uh, all these terms that people put on music and art. Uh, because what he was doing was not necessarily always what we might consider to be jazz. And so if you say, well, Miles Davis is a jazz musician and then he plays something that's not jazz, then you're going to be like, well, th that's going to affect your judgment of what he's playing. And likewise in life, you know, if you pick teams and if you, if you pick lanes and you say, well, this is what I am and this is what I do and... Um, you know, this is the, you know, even within philosophy and, and stoicism, I'll get to that soon, but it can affect your judgment because then all of a sudden you're in that lane and if, if you are forced outside of that lane, then you're very uncomfortable. You know, it, it, it's, it's like the story of Louis Armstrong. You know, he didn't like the bebop that was coming along because it was uncomfortable to him because it, what it represented was a new form of music that challenged the boundaries that were set by his kind of style of music. And so all of a sudden, there's a challenger there, you know, and, and it, it went the same way. You know, the people who were playing bebop, they called these people who were sticking with the older styles, uh, the moldy figs is what they called them, uh, because they were just sitting there getting moldy. And, and, you know, you think about that, how this kind of relates to your life. You know, in, in Stoicism, we talk about this principle, as I said, of the Logos, the governing principle, that that principle that if we listen to, it's often uh, likened to the Word, uh, you know, Jesus Christ in, in the Bible is the incarnation of the Word or the Logos. 
Um, it's often likened to truth, uh, speech, um, you know, and 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 so it's it's wisdom. Um, but the logos doesn't belong to a team. It doesn't belong to the future or the past. It doesn't belong anywhere other than what is the for example, here's where it belongs. What is the best, most true, uh, and most sincere next move in my life, for example? And if you listen to interviews with Miles Davis, if you listen to his music, if you listen to interviews about Miles Davis, that's the impression that you get is that what Miles was asking was not how do I make the most money, was not how do I, you know, get the mo- the biggest crowds who want to hear the album that I did 20 years ago. It wasn't uh, how do I pick my lane and stay in it. The question that he was asking was what is the most true, sincere, honest, best next move for my music? And he was letting that flow through his his trumpet. And you know, we get a sense of this as well. I want to read you a great quote from from Carlos Santana. Um, so Carlos was being interviewed about his time with Miles, and and uh, the interviewer kind of asked if he was surprised that Miles started playing pop and rock music, and Santana said, "No, I wasn't surprised because I knew he had that kind of heart. I think only ignorant people are like cows that regurgitate and eat the same thing." I always knew that Miles was a person who had a big heart and his finger wanted to be on the pulse of what was happening right now. We love him for that because he was always pushing forward. And so, you know, I I love the language that Santana uses. He also has another great quote um, where he talks about how what Miles taught him in the band was to execute your heart's convictions. And that's really what he was all about. He was about nothing else other than I'm going to execute my heart's convictions. I'm going to listen to the next sound that is supposed to be coming through. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if, if people don't come along with me and that confidence that he had paid off because people did come along with him. If you remember my interview with, uh, with Benjamin Cawthra, um, the historian who followed the life of Miles Davis, uh, you know, he says that Miles was creatively fearless. You know, he pushed forward no matter what. He didn't care who came with him. And in that confidence, he actually found that people realized there was something deeply brilliant about what he was doing. And, uh, you know, I wanted to give you guys an example of something I saw recently, which is a perfect example of the kind of team playing that would have stopped somebody like Miles Davis uh, from being who he was and creating what he created and and listening to those sounds that he was supposed to be playing through his horn, you know. Uh, and, and I want to bring this into the realm of stoicism because what what's really interesting is, uh, or to me at least, is that when I started out uh, with this podcast, when I started talking about stoicism, I, I look back at my time... Uh, talking about this philosophy and I think, you know, I definitely fall into that category of somebody who was kind of an ideologue, somebody who uh, fell into the the tribe of Stoicism, the, uh, the team of Stoicism, uh, and then that was possibly the most important thing uh, to me that I, that, I, that I played within that tribe. Um, and that really affects your judgment, you know. Uh, I think that Sharon LaBelle um, was was really the best person who taught me something about this this year. Uh, you know, I was interviewing her, and some of you will remember, I, I asked a question about, you know, I can't exactly remember the question. I'm going to move on from the, the question, but the answer that she gave was essentially something like, you know, I'm not ne- necessarily falling into the category of any ism, you know, I... I draw inspiration from, say, Buddhism and Stoicism and all kinds of philosophies and life and what I learn and what I experience. And, and you know, that's a difficult thing to do because there's there's not a lot of safety in that herd, you know, that we like as human beings. You don't get that safety of the herd, the safety of the group. But it also expands your possibilities. And 
you know, I look back at my time and I think that's not the direction that I want to go anymore. I don't want to go in that direction of simply picking a team or a tribe and, and you know, sticking with that team or tribe. Uh, I want to expand the possibilities, expand the horizons um, of what is possible within my own philosophical thinking. And you can't expand the horizons of your own philosophical thought if you've picked a lane. You know, if you, you I, I think that um, it's it's completely uh, normal and and healthy and 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 wonderful to say, well, like, you know, may, maybe I am a stoic, or maybe I am a uh, you know, Aristotelian, or maybe I am a Christian, whatever, whatever it is that you are, like, I I don't mind. As long as you also uh, put the logos, that governing principle uh, that governs between what was and what is on a higher playing field, on a higher level of your, uh, your moral hierarchy and characteristic uh, hierarchy than the team that you're playing in. Because that way, what's going to happen is you're going to bring value back to the tribe and change the tribe and grow the tribe and 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 influence uh, the tribe how you want it to be. Um, you're not just going to be sticking in the lane. But if you put the tribe above the Logos or above that governing principle, uh, that's when you become an ideologue. That's when all of a sudden you're not thinking, the tribe is thinking for you. Um and so that's the sort of lesson that I get out of the the life of Miles Davis. And there was, I want to give you guys an example. I, I felt that I had to give this example because it's such a potent um, example of, of how this sort of thinking gets in the way of us actually learning anything or seeing something that could be valuable that we could bring into the tribe. Um, and it's it's a moment that I've, I saw on um, on the Facebook group, uh, the Practical Stoic Mastermind, uh, recently. So somebody posted this this wonderful quote uh, from Jordan Peterson, uh, and and look, Jordan Peterson is a a a figure that people tend to have either really strong views for or really strong views against. Um, but uh, but it was a great quote. And, and I can't remember the quote, but it, it, it was great and, uh, and it was very wise and, um, you know, hopefully was helpful for a lot of people. But that post got way more traction than a lot of the stuff that happens on, on the Mastermind. And the reason was because as soon as it was posted, people started getting into the discussion around, is Jordan Peterson a Stoic? Is he a Stoic? Is he not a Stoic? Here's why I think he's not a Stoic. Here's why I think he is a Stoic. Uh, you know, a lot of um, sort of ad hominem attacks on his character, um, you know, a lot of that sort of stuff. And I was kind of thinking, isn't it interesting that a conversation isn't happening right now around whether or not that's an interesting quote or idea? Isn't it interesting that the conversation goes, actually skips the philosophical discussion of what that quote might mean and, and, and what it could mean for your life and whether it would be valuable or not. And it goes straight to, is he a part of our tribe? And I thought that that was very interesting. And I think that it's, it's, it's very helpful to look at that kind of conversation and say, that's when essentially we've put the tribe above the Logos. We've put the tribe above wisdom, the tribe above philosophy you know, because if you're searching for wisdom, if you're really a lover of wisdom, a a philosopher, then that cannot happen. You have to put the wisdom, the, 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 the value of the idea before the tribe, uh, because that's how you actually bring value back to the tribe. Um, and so I thought that that was an interesting representation of this kind of, uh, kind of principle that I've been really learning from the life of Miles Davis, which was, you know, if somebody ever mentioned to him, which they did, uh, actually, it's an interesting quote from one of the interviews. If somebody mentioned to him, uh, hey, listen, um, what do you think about, uh, you know, those who say that jazz is being doctored or, you know, it's 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 going away from its original roots. It's going away from, uh, you know, its, its original uh, ideas, you know, he would have, and he did say, uh, you know, that 
that that just means that it's dead. There's no point in talking about it. There's no point in talking about jazz or labeling it as jazz because what's the point of of being a part of something that, you know, if somebody says it, they immediately think that they know what you think. He wasn't a musical ideologue. He was a creator and a philosopher of music and what he brought about didn't necessarily fit into those categories, but nonetheless, it completely changed the world. So interesting things to think about. And I hope that this episode has kind of given you some food for thought in the way that you think yourself. Um, and uh, it's certainly given, you know, learning about his his career has certainly given me food for thought and made me think, you know, wow, like what, what, am, what am I doing? You know, am I putting myself into too many categories or, or too little categories um, and stifling my ability to think effectively? Uh, in fact, you know, his, his influence really helped me to see that it was totally okay for me in the album that I've just produced, which will be um, out in the next couple of months, I hope. Um, you know, it made me realize it's okay for me to not do a jazz album. It's okay for me to do a piano album um, and to add all kinds of different sounds and to, to do something strange that might not necessarily be something that... I would expect a lot of people to <laughs> find the most enjoyment in, but something that is uniquely me, that some, is something that uh, I believe is beautiful, that I want to bring to the world. Um, and, and so, yeah, he's really influenced me in that way. And I think that it's, it's, it's really helpful to take these lessons and say, you know, how is my thought being affected by the labels I'm putting around my thought? Uh, by the hierarchy that I have in in my own moral and character um, development, uh, you know, what what does my heart want? What do I believe is the truest and most sincere step forward in my life? Not what other people want from me, not what the world says they want from me, but what do I want to bring to this world? What do I want to do? What do I want to create? Um, I hope that I hope that that really helps you to think a little bit about that sort of stuff and definitely check out Miles Davis. Please go listen to his music. Uh, please go, you know, watch interviews with him on, on, <laughs> on the internet. Uh, seriously, you'll have a great time watching interviews with Miles Davis. He's absolutely hilarious. Um, and, uh, and, and quite a, quite a strange, but, um, profound character. Uh, so next week, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the wisdom of Miles Davis as it pertains to uh, changing your mistakes into masterpieces. Uh, really interesting lesson philosophically and and just very wisdom-based. Um, and I know that you guys are going to love it. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll talk to you guys next week. <laughs>